Okay, welcome to the book launch of uh, Parliamentary Committees in the Policy Process, edited by Sven Siefken and Hilma Rommetsvet, and published in the Routledge series Library of Legislative Studies. Uh, my name's uh, Stephen Holden Bates. Um, I'm the co-convener of the PSA Parliament's specialist group, who is, uh, which are one of the uh, co-sponsors of the book launch today, along with the research committee of legislative specialists um, from IPSA. Uh, we've got a brilliant uh, lineup of speakers today. In a moment, I'm going to pass over to Sven Siefkin, one of the editors, to say a few welcoming words. And then we've got um, Lord, Lord Norton of Louth. Philip Norton will say uh, something, who's the editor of the um, book series. Then we have um, some speakers uh, who contributed chapters to the edited collection. Anne-Marie Camisa, Pablo Onyata, uh, Hilma Romertsvet, who is also one of the editors of the book, Sven Siefkin, and then uh, Irina Kamelko um, from uh, RCLS uh, will say a few words at the end. And then there'll be plenty of times for plenty of time for questions and uh, discussion uh, before we finish. So, Sven, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stephen, and uh, welcome everybody to this um, uh, book launch. Um, welcome to all the contributors who have joined, and uh, all of you. I see many names of people that are working on committees themselves or have worked uh, in the past, and obviously you're interested in parliamentary committees, and that is nice, um, because so are we. And so for this particular audience, I actually don't really need to introduce, but I thought in a way it has to be in every book about committees, the famous quote by Woodrow Wilson from his PhD dissertation that <coughs> Congress in session is Congress on public exhibition, whilst Congress in its committee rooms is Congress at work. Um, and that has become kind of the general uh, assumption about committees in many parliaments. Um, and they have been repeatedly studies, uh, studied. Um, I took a few photos of just a pile of books that I have here on my desk. Um, and one of them, of course, is this edited volume um, that came out of the PSA in 1979 um, by um, uh, John Lees and Malcolm Shaw. And so was the uh, PSA, I think the comparative politics group that um, started um, also as a workshop, bringing together contributions from different uh, country specialists. Um, and I think it's still worth reading today, but of course things have changed. And uh, 20 years after that, um, there was a big compilation um, which came out of the IPSA uh, context, um, first as a working paper um, compiled by Lawrence Longley and Attila Ach, and then later on also as an edited volume and um, a special issue. And so that's um, 20 years after the first book, and 20 years on, um, Hilma Romedbet um, uh, organized in the IPSA Congress in Brisbane, Australia in 2018, one or actually a few panels on committees. Um, and when we got together there, we thought, wow, it's another 20 years. It looks like we have to uh, do something about it. Every 20 years, there has to be a major work about committees. And so that's what we set out to do. And then um, um, published a call for contributions in order to assemble specialists from different countries um, and about different countries. Um, and uh, Pablo Onyato was so um, uh, helpful to set up this workshop meeting in Valencia. This is a little bit less than two years ago. Um, and out of this workshop, um, we are now happy to present the results after a lot of work. And I thank you all that have contributed in these uh, two, um, two years since then and getting this volume out today. And um, so I think um, I will leave it at that as a general introduction. Um, and of course, the question is um, what we should remember um, who is going to pick up the next 
committee's volume in 2039. That uh, is kind of the long wave that we should um, expect. Stephen has already introduced um, the speakers. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, Philip Lord Norton of Laos has uh, accepted our book into um, the series that he's editing at Routledge. Um, and we're uh, even more happy that you're joining us today as somebody similar to Woodrow Wilson in a way, because you're moving back and forth between politics and uh, academic study uh, of politics. And then Anne-Marie is going to talk about her chapter um, of about the United States Congress, Pablo Oñate about uh, the Spanish uh, uh, Congreso de los Disputados, obviously wrong, my Spanish, and um, Ilma Romedvet, um, I don't even try <laughs> the Norve Norwegian um, parliament. Um, <laughs> And then I will get it together and um, have a few uh, of our comparative findings. And uh, Irina Kmelko is shortly going to introduce the work of the RCLS before we get into a general discussion um, and questions. So the idea is really to have short presentations and then focus on the discussion because we have so many experts here uh, who have something to say. And with that, I hand it over um, to you, uh, Lord Norton. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And as been mentioned, I'm here in my capacity as editor of the Routledge Library of Legislative Studies. And I'm delighted to welcome this edition to the library. I think the library itself has the best list that there is in Legislative Studies. And the book adds to and complements some splendid volumes. And among the previous volumes is one on the, uh, on the new roles of parliamentary committees, rather picking up on Sven's point, because it was published back in 1998, and indeed a work to which one of the co-editors of this volume uh, contributed. So I'm delighted that we have another work on parliamentary committees. Indeed, I was excited when I first received the proposal for uh, the volume, and I wasn't surprised when my judgment was confirmed by the referees. It is a work covering a vital aspect of legislative life, and does so from a sophisticated perspective. And that combination rendered it especially attractive. And I'm so pleased to see it's been brought to fruition. As the editors of the earlier volume I mentioned, Larry Longley and Roger Davidson wrote, there's been a growth of the centrality of committees, not only in a few parliaments, but as a global phenomenon. Even as newly democratic parliaments throughout the world experiment with more elaborate committee structures, those with older, highly developed committee systems are reaching for more varied and flexible alternatives. In short, parliamentary committees have emerged as vibrant and central institutions of democratic parliaments of today's world and have begun to define new and changing roles for themselves. So in the library, I mean, we've covered new democracies in Central and Eastern Europe and indeed Southern Europe in earlier volumes. But as the quote indicates, there's a need to study legislatures in established democracies. And I'm very conscious in the context of Westminster parliaments, which traditionally have been chamber oriented, how they have become more specialised institutions, utilising committees on an extensive basis. And that's certainly true of the UK parliament, where committee work is now a pervasive and resource intensive feature of parliamentary life. And for some members, committee work is more absorbing than working in the chamber. Having chaired a select committee and having spent most of my parliamentary life serving on committees, indeed at one stage I was serving on three, I know how they can able, enable members to influence policy more effectively than through the chamber. Now, committees in the chamber obviously are not mutually exclusive that committees facilitate more subtle influence than is possible in plenary session. And although, as Stephen Bates and his fellow editors noted in a recent special issue of the Journal of Legislative Studies on committees in comparative perspective, there are various theories about committees, not least derived from the US Congress, but as they note, they merit modification. And we need to rethink what scholars expect to achieve through studying committees. And as Reuven Hassan has noted, and as Sven has picked up on, there aren't enough books on the topic. And as they've mentioned, it's been quite a few years since uh, the last one, though I hope the next one won't be another 20 years uh, in uh, coming. 
So there is a need for a major work that not just examines committees, but does so in a truly comparative and systematic way within a clear, consistent framework. And I think parliamentary committees in the policy process is that major work. As far as I'm concerned, it's lived up to expectations, the rather high expectations I had when I first read the proposal. It is a major contributor, uh, contribution to the literature. And as I told the publishers at the time, will be a feather in the cap of the Library of Legislative Studies. I'm sure it will have a major impact. And I look forward very much to hearing now the contributions from those who've added their scholarship to the volume. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lord Norton of that. Uh, we'll just go straight on to Anne-Marie uh, Camisa and her presentation. Um, so thank you very much to everybody, to Hilmar and Sven for organizing this book, um, organizing the book launch, to Stephen for um, the conversation, and to Lord Norton for that wonderful introduction. I am very pleased and happy to be part of this uh, this project. Um, and so I'm going to talk about, um, I'm very glad that Sven began with a, a uh, quote from Woodrow Wilson, because I'm going to talk about my chapter, which um, is called Specially Commissioned Com Minorities, which is from that very same quote, the larger quote, which I'll show you in a moment. So Specially Commissioned Minorities. Woodrow Wilson began, um, or the quote that, that Sven had from uh, Woodrow Wilson, I'm going to give you the quote in full. Woodrow Wilson says, the House sits not for serious discussion, but to sanction the conclusions of its committees as rapidly as possible. It legislates in its committee rooms, not by the determination of majorities, but by the resolution of specially commissioned minorities, title of my chapter, so that it is not far from the truth to say that Congress in session is Congress on public exhibition, whilst Congress in its committee rooms is Congress at work. So Woodrow Wilson is talking about this idea that we have too, he's basically saying that there's too much work that goes on in committee rooms and that the work should actually be going on. He, he wants Congress to become more like a parliamentary system, um, but that obviously did not happen. So um, what Woodrow Wilson, so what, what I would like to talk about a little bit is the fact that, um, and my slide shows, uh, uh, froze on me as well. I can't see my notes. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about is two two tracks that that Congress has gone on. One is that the institution of committees has be, they become extremely institutionalized and they're an extremely important part of the system. We started in America with an ad hoc committee system. So when Congress initially would meet, they discuss a particular piece uh, issue and come to some sort of consensus and then send that consensus off to a committee to make a decision, bring back the legislation, vote on the legislation, the committee disbanded. Now what we have is permanent standing committees. The reason why we have this is because the policies have become more complex, they've become more complicated, and there's really no way to get the work done unless you have these committees. So these committees have become entrenched in the policy process. And I'll talk about that just a little bit. One, one way to look at how entrenched they are in the policy process is to look at how rule bound the committees are. So the committees face four sources of authority. The first source is there's legislative statutes. There's legislative reorganization acts that actually say that committees uh, need to be in place and give some descriptions as to what their jurisdiction should be, what their duties are. So, and one thing that the legislation specifies is that committees need to have open processes. So committee meetings need to be open. Obviously there's some exceptions to that. Um, so that's legislative authority. Also, each Congress, as the Congress begins, the Congress begins every two years, Congress begins and there will be a, uh, a discussion among the majority party caucus creating the rules of that Congress for committees, for the rules for the entire house, but those rules contain uh, provisions for committees. And those are discussed, those are proposed in the caucus of the majority party, and then they are voted on in the floor of the entire house. So committees face legislative statute and also they face uh, rules that come from the house itself. And then in addition to that, 
each of the parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, has specific rules for its committees as well. So a committee has to, or the members of the committee on that particular party, have to face those rules for the Democrats or for the Republicans. Um, and so there are legislative statutes, there are the House rules, there are the party rules, and finally, each committee sets up it, oh, its own set of rules. So the committee itself has to follow its own rules that are based on um, the rules of the other sort of higher authorities. So there's basically um, four or five, if you count both parties, sources of authority for committees in the US Congress. And this means that they are highly institutionalized. They are also highly rule bound. So they're really part of the system and they're really, it would be difficult to extricate committees from the way that Congress does its work. So that's one way. So the committees have become institutionalized over time. But another thing that's happened over time is there has been a power struggle between basically committees and parties. And basically, it's, it's, there's a threefold power struggle. Political parties want to have control, and political parties do control the committees. If the political parties decided not to have committees, there wouldn't be committees. So the parties and the committees are sort of in, um, uh, uh, in some cases, in opposition to each other. Um, but the political parties also face opposition from the committee chairs and then also from the committee rank and file. So in the, the in US Congress, we always talk about the revolt, revolt of 1910, revolt against the speaker. The committee chairs felt that the speaker was taking too much power and appointing committee chairs, thought that committee chairs should be appointed instead by seniority. And so basically stripped the, the, the chair of his powers and took over so that the committees became more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the party and that power was centralized in the chairs. Then we had the 1970s when there were the committee chairs were Southern Democrats. They were uh, against civil rights. They were not progressive. They faced an influx of uh, what we called Watergate babies, people who were elected in the 70s with progressive agendas who thought that they couldn't get anything done with these committee chairs who were there by senior Seniority. And so they decided to break seniority and they said we should have the rank and file choose the chairs. So the rank and file then became more powerful in the committees. But the interesting thing about that is in order to become more powerful, the rank and file had to get the party so it was Democrats had to get the Democratic Party to change the rules so that the rank and file would be the ones who are selecting the chairs of the committee rather than uh, seniority or the speaker. So that's this, this history of this sort of um, uh, balance of power between the committees, the parties, and the committee rank and file. And where are we now? Well, it started in, uh, in 1994 with the contract with America Congress. Newt Gingrich came in and said, yeah, that's very nice that we have the committees um, uh, dealing with the, the committee rank and file uh, voting for the chairs. Uh, but I really think the committees need to be more in the party, uh, under the party. And so he increased the power of the party. Um, and there's been a trend for that. So including Nancy Pelosi, very powerful speaker, also facing a very difficult week this week. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, very powerful speaker, Speaker in the US Congress um, also has taken control of the committees. And one thing that started with Gingrich and is continuing um, under Nancy Pelosi is that oftentimes if the party doesn't like what the committees are doing, they will pull legislation from the committee and give it to a task force, um, or they will just figure out legislation among the leadership of the party. So taking away power from the parties power from the committees and putting it back in the parties. Um, so I think Hilmar helped me with the, this sort of formulation, but when we look at, at what uh, Woodrow Wilson said, Congress in committees is Congress at work, I think one way to think about it um, is Congress in committees is parties at work. Uh, now we're going to go over to Pablo Anyata, who's going to talk about the Spanish case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, and thank you very much, first of all, to Sven and Hilmar for uh, putting together this book with a lot of work on their side uh, and, and uh, with a lot of generosity. I think that it was a great opportunity to have you all here in Valencia and have the chance to discuss and, and then see the result that came out of these uh, discussions. I think that uh, the editors did a great job uh, editing the book, putting it together. Uh, so thank you. And thank you very much to um, for this opportunity to have this seminar today to discuss some of the 
of the chapters or parts of the chapters. I think that is a, a great to see all these colleagues again. Um, I would like to focus um, in one of the specific features of the uh, committees in the Spanish uh, Parliament, in the Spanish Congress of los Diputados and Senado, which is the extraordinary powers that committees have in Spain regarding uh, legislative, uh, legislative production. Um, as you know, um, the Spanish Constitution states that we have uh, the, the, the houses, the Senate and the, and the Congress of los Diputados may act in the plenary or in committees. But uh, Section 75 of the Constitution states that the houses might delegate this to the standing legislative committees the approval of governmental or non-governmental bills. However, the plenary uh, might at any time demand a, debate, a debate and a vote on any bill which has been the object of that delegation. So with the aid of the standing orders of Congreso de los Diputados, um, it is stated that the decision of Congress delegating full legislative authority to committees shall be presumed for all bills that might constitutionally be delegated. And there are some exceptions for that delegation. It cannot be delegated um, bills regarding constitutional reform, international affairs, basic law or organic law, and the um, general state budget. Other than that, all the bills can be delegated to the uh, committees, and therefore it will be the committees who will discuss and finally approve any bill which will not go to the plenary anymore. They will go to the Senate after the Congress of los Diputados and then they will be passed. So um, this has given an uh, immense um, power to committees and I'd like to uh, share the screen here. Um, let me see if it's this one here. Uh, no, 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 it's not this one here, sorry. I'm sorry for this. It was ready a while ago, so let me see if I can. Oh, here we are. Okay. So I'd like to take this example of the 10th and the 12th Congress um, regarding, you see the governmental bills and the private bills, and you see the percentage of those passed in committees without the, uh, any action from the plenary. You see that there are quite a number of the government bills that are passed in the uh, committees without any participation of the plenary. The percentage is quite lower regarding the private bills, although also the number of bills that are passed, the number of private bills that are passed are fewer as well. So you see that uh, there are differences, of course, in these uh, two um, Congress, this was a majority. The 10th Congress was a Congress in which the Partido Popular had a majority, whereas the 12th Congress, there was not a majority. The uh, Congress was uh, much more fragmented and therefore it was more difficult to have this, uh, this law. But anyway, the, the number of uh, the amount of bills that are passed by committees is quite high uh, and under this delegation of power by the, by the plenary. Um, of course, that would probably be shocking for, for um, experts uh, in, in countries where this delegation is not allowed and, and committees don't have uh, such an extraordinary power. But I'd like to um, nuance that power of the committees, taking into account or, or, or outlining that the uh, parliamentary party groups in Spain have also extraordinary powers. They are uh, really hierarchical, highly centralized and highly cohesive uh, parliamentary party groups. They control almost all the activity of the individual members and therefore there will be no, there will be no surprises uh, in, the voting, uh, in the voting of any bill. So basically, since committees reproduce the distribution of seats of the plenary, so the distribution of seats in the committee must be proportional to that in the plenary, uh, there will be no surprise, and, and the parliamentary party groups control almost fully the voting uh, action of the of the different uh, of the individual MPs, there wouldn't be uh, a big surprise uh, in the voting. Actually, the voting in the plenary is, um, the, the, as in many other countries, the discipline, the voting discipline is very high, and therefore the PPG controls the voting in the committee and controls the voting in the plenary. Um, 
committee sessions are, are not public. Uh, public cannot, is not allowed into the committee sessions, but the media are allowed in the committee sessions. So actually the public is well informed about the activity in the committee. Therefore, um, we could wonder uh, what is the reason to have this second session or second debate, of course, in the plenary. Uh, when asked, uh, when, when we have asked uh, congressmen or congresswomen, MPs, about this, they said that they feel comfortable with having this discussion in the committees, which are uh, which are the places where the real experts are, as, as uh, Anne-Marie was uh, mentioning about the United States case. Uh, these are the places where Congress works. Well, uh, the technical work is developed there, and therefore the debate in the plenary uh, they say, would be just a repetition of the same arguments and a repetition of the same votes uh, regarding the bill. So it seems that they don't feel uncomfortable with having this kind of delegation, so there is not a final vote um, uh, in the plenary. Of course, the plenary is uh, allowed to ask for, to revert that delegation anytime, and they will have a final say in any bill uh, that they want to, to have this final say. Um, I will stop here. Um, of course, the chapter deals the, the chapter on Spain deals with all the other uh, topics, but I think that this is a specific feature of the Spanish case this is, that is not that common in, in other countries. I just wanted to mention it there and leave it there uh, for the debate. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, uh, Pablo, and um, thank you too for organizing the workshop in Valencia. Uh, you know, I still think about the swordfish on the second night, even, even today. Um, so now we're moving on to uh, Hilma, who's going to talk about the Norwegian case. Yes, thank you, uh, Stephen, and uh, also thank you to Pablo for a very nice uh, workshop in Valencia. Uh, in general, as we have seen and heard, um, strong committees have been considered to be a necessary, if not a sufficient uh, condition for a strong and influential parliament. Um, and and um, in the case of Norway, it's quite obvious that the parliament is a strong and influential one. And consequently, based on the international literature prior to our book, uh, we should expect Norwegian parliamentary committees to be strong. And the 12 standing committees of the Norwegian parliament, the Storting, uh, have been put, portrayed as the workhorses of the, the institution. With a few exceptions, um, all Norwegian MPs are members of one and only one of the standing committees which uh, specialize in various policy areas. Uh, and as far as possible, the parties are proportionally represented. That is also the case with regard to chair, the chairs of the committees that uh, both uh, government and opposition parties may have chairs of uh, committees. Uh, almost all matters to be dealt with are submitted to one of the committees. The committee produces a report or what we call a recommendation to the parliament with a summary of the issue and uh, comments and proposals from the, of the majority and various minorities of the committee members. Plenary debates and decisions are then based on the committee recommendation. Uh, 50 years ago, Goodman Harness, uh, who interviewed uh, members of the parliament, found that the committee stage was the first and for most practical purposes also the last and definitely the most important stage in the parliamentary process. Uh, nearly two decades later, outgoing conservative MP Georg Oppenet uh, indicated that this uh, was changing. Breakthrough and clarification occurred less frequently in the committees. And uh, in the special issue on uh, committees of, of the Journal of Legislative Studies, I concluded rather cautiously that the importance and influence of the Norwegian parliament had increased in spite of rather weak uh, committees. Nevertheless, until recently, uh, this, the, the parliament claimed that the, the real decisions 
are made uh, in in um, in the committees. But as we will see, this is not really the case. In fact, today Norwegian parliamentary committees are rather weak. <clears throat> Let's have a look at some elements that may contribute to the weakening of the committees. Norway has fixed four-year election period. Uh, and as you can see here, less than 20% of the MPs are now re-elected to the same committee as in the previous period. Some replacements may also occur during the four-year period. The high turnover in committees implicates that the specialization on issues related to the specific sector policies is rather limited. And of course, this may weaken the committees. Uh, furthermore, um, uh, committees may, or, or committees operating as unitary actors may be strong and influential. However, the occurrence of disagreement and dissent within the committees weaken weakened the co committee influence. And as we see prior to 1973, dissent occurred in approximately 16% of the committee recommendations. After the millennium, this uh, share has increased to 72%. In other words, committees are split. In a survey carried out by Ketel Raknes and myself, we asked uh, the MPs uh, to tell what goes on in the committees. And the answer are rather overwhelming, I would say. The formal and full committee meetings are short, maybe five to 10 minutes, and they deal with practical and administrative matters like deadlines, schedules, and so on. The real political negotiations occur seldom or never in the committees. In fact, 18% of the MPs said never uh, on the so where then are the real decisions made? Uh, as we see, fifty-seven percent of the MPs uh, said that said seldom or never in the committee meeting. Almost a third of the MPs said never in the committees. On the other hand, 80% of the MPs said that the real decisions were often made in negotiations outside the committee. A selection of parties with a majority of the seats in the parliament negotiate policies and make the real decisions, one could say. And committees as such uh, are sidelined in the process. Finally, um, in earlier surveys, MPs have assessed the power of various groups and institutions in the Norwegian parliament. Um, and as we can see from um, uh, uh, in, in 2012, uh, the committees were ranked sixth among these uh, groups and institutions. Both the committee scores and the ranking dropped from 1996. That's we can see. In other words, government and the parliamentary parties are the most important actors in the parliamentary process. And it's interesting also to note that committee chairs are, are not very powerful in, in the case of Norway, uh, ranked on eight, uh, number eight in, in 2012. So, um, in spite of the strength of the parliament, Norwegian parliamentary committees are rather weak. Turnover in membership is high. Committees do not operate as unitary actors. And political compromises are negotiated outside the committee rooms among selected parties and then included in the committee recommendations. Uh, the Norwegian parliament uh, is strong like the, as the lions that uh, are located outside the parliamentary building, but the committees are not. 
And our book uh, indicates that uh, this is the case, not only in Norway, but also in several other countries, even though, of course, uh, the strengths of committees vary. So that was it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hilma. Uh, and we now move on to Sven, who I think is going to uh, present on some of the comparative aspects of the project. Yeah, and um, thank you very much. Um, I think I will pick up a few points um, that have been mentioned in the previous um, presentations. Um, um, Anne-Marie and Pablo talked about the important role um, of parties. Um, Pablo mentioned uh, a particular transparency of committee sessions. Um, and uh, of course, Hilma uh, talked about negotiations and how they happen or don't happen um, in committees. And these are, in a way, these are big topics to understand. And we have tried to uh, go at it uh, in this volume with a unified framework, not mechanical, but we asked all the contributors to address a list of questions, which is also included in the, in the book. Um, we do have, as a starting point, um, the situation that committees are everywhere. Um, so we have the same phenomenon, not only in parliaments, but everybody everywhere else. Whenever we think of political decision making, it's a running gag in, in a way to set up a committee first, um, uh, even if you don't want to get something done. And if you want to get something done too, so you need a committee. I mean, um, uh, but uh, looking at it more closely, we did indeed find uh, in this comparative uh, um, perspective huge variation, huge variation that is not entirely new. We knew before that there is quite some variation in the institutional setting, in the question, what can committees do in one system and what can they not do uh, in another system? Uh, Pablo just mentioned this um, delegation of final decision-making um, authority in the Spanish case, which is exceptional, but it exists uh, in a few um, countries. And the topic of transparency uh, is something that exists uh, in some countries as a default and in others, um, it doesn't. Um, so we knew there was variation, but what we looked at is not just institutional characteristics. We looked, uh, wanted to get a feeling inside uh, committees, not just what the rules are, but what is really happening. This was very much uh, our interest, and this is why we um, asked contributors who knew the parliaments well. This was not to be meant, uh, not meant to be desk research, uh, but it was meant to be uh, people who have been on the inside of parliaments and many of our contributors have been or still are. Um, and so they have this uh, perspective also from inside the committee room to get something and report something about the atmosphere, about the culture and about the variation. Um, and what we also did, and this is also a difference between the, the, the previous literature, we didn't limit ourselves to established democracies or Western uh, democracies. We very much um, had this, and this is of course the thinking of the International Political Science Association too, we very much had this open to transitioning countries. And uh, sadly, we have to say that not every transitioning country is transitioning towards democracy nowadays. There's also other directions of transition countries. Um, so but we kept it deliberately open. Um, we, in, in that regard, of course, there is no representative sample um, in, in this book, um, but uh, the, the strength is that we have good um, description from people who really know parliaments. What we know is that, or what we commonly say is um, not only committees are everywhere, we usually say there's around 20 committees and they have around 20 members. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, this is actually not wrong, um, but uh, the variation is extremely, extremely high. Um, and uh, just move to the next slide here. I hope this didn't crash 
two. No, it didn't. Um, first of all, what are committees? Uh, there are different types of committees. This is not entirely new, but uh, Lord Norton just talked about it. There's an ongoing differentiation. Um, we have, uh, of course, the classic, um, usually permanent committees in most of the systems um, and but what exactly they do whether they are only active in legislation or whether they also do oversight tasks or in reverse if special committees for oversight are set up and how this is something where there's a lot of variation in the details the same with regard to uh, subcommittees how are subcommittees used uh, how many and are they delegated uh, particular tasks um, so this is just the first um, step here to try to put order to this to this uh, big variety of um, of committee types as i said we usually have around uh, 20 committees in the parliament but if we look at the real numbers here just among the cases that we've studied um, it goes from uh, eight, which are defined by the Constitution, plus three more uh, in the French case, to 109 committees currently in Nigeria. Um, and if we take out these two outliers, we get to the average uh, here, which is 21.8 um, uh, committees uh, in, in one um, parliament. Now, if we look at the size of committee, we do find the same uh, strong variation. We have some, um, and again, we can only uh, calculate here with, with averages. Uh, on average, there are 19 members per committee. But again, the variation is the interesting thing. Just a few countries, um, because the variation is not just between countries, but within countries. In Hungary, the smallest committee has six and the biggest 39. In Germany, the smallest has 14 and the biggest 49. In the US, the smallest has 10 and the biggest 60 members. Um, and that, of course, is something that brings to question this fundamental democratic theory aspect of why do we have committees? This is, of course, going back to Giovanni Sartori, who says it's a small group of people who interact with each other repeatedly. They trust each other. They build trust. They can make bargains, deals, uh, compensate over time, lock rolling uh, and all that. But if we look at these sizes, then we see with 60 people, that is probably not going to work. So there seems to be something already fundamentally opposed to the theoretic strength of committees just in their composition. When we look at transparency, something similar comes up because we have increasing demands for open committee sessions. Um, and um, this has just been mentioned um, by Pablo, but this is not only the Spanish case. About half of the countries that we have studied here have open sessions by default now, visible to the public, either through presence or um, through the media. While the other half is quite the opposite, has closed sessions that is following more the theoretical argument that sessions should be closed and then the plenary should be there to present the results. So again, obviously already from the institutional characteristics, we see um, that the theoretical strength of committees in reality uh, are uh, often um, worked against by how they are handled. And this um, feeds very much into the findings that have been mentioned, uh, especially by, uh, by Hilma right now, um, where is the real music playing? Is it really the real work going on in committees? And as we said, um, many of the authors in this volume cast uh, doubt on that. Um, we do need to integrate the understanding and the relationship with the parliamentary party groups um, and committees do, and, and that is uh, our argument, committees uh, are not the main place of negotiation, if at all, but that doesn't mean that they are in any way irrelevant. It means that we have to understand them differently. We have to, first of all, understand them differently by zooming into committees, um, zooming into parliament, looking more closely, not just as in, at institutions, but at the real interaction, at the culture uh, of committees. Because that also came up very clearly, there is variation, again, in parliaments, 
one committee has this friendly collaboration uh, collegial culture and the next one doesn't even both of even though both of them are um, composed by members of parliament proportionally to the size of the parties um, why is that and why do we find this across um, uh, parliaments and are, are there similar variations across uh, parliament we could not at first glance uh, find them we just found the variation here um, but this is something that the future studies will have to investigate um, more closely um, the other point um, apart from zooming into committees that we think or i think is necessary for future research is uh, to zoom out um, to zoom out and not just um, end our perspective at the walls of the parliament or even at the walls of the committee rooms, but look at the committees in the broader context, and that's what the title is hinting at, in policy making. Um, look at the committees as a crystallization point for the MPs, for the representatives, um, as actors in the policy networks. And in that way, we will better understand that they do have an influence, but not as the place of negotiation. But they assign a portfolio to an individual MP who is then, because of his membership or her membership in that committee, who is then a central actor um, together with others in the policy network. And I think that is an integration that we very much need for future parliamentary studies to not limit ourselves to the parliamentary perspective that ends at the wall of the houses, but to look at them more broadly in the context of the political system. And with that, um, I, I'm not going through this graph here. This is again this, this perspective, this broader perspective and the importance to look at committees on the one hand and at the parliamentary party groups and their relationship. Um, and what we do see is this assignment of um, a portfolio to an MP. We see it right now in Germany after an election. It's still too early, but that's, of course, the biggest question for a newly elected MP. What is he going to be in two years? Is he going to be an expert on foreign policy or is he going to be an expert on petitions? God forbid. Or is he going to be uh, uh, in the um, interior uh, um, committee? And, and that is a decision that the individual MP doesn't make alone. This is uh, something that is happening right now. There's a lot of uh, shuffling going on. And that is an important step um, that uh, we need to take into account. And um, this is uh, our general outlook. So I would say, um, and this is, of course, a good tradition for academic research, we probably as a conclusion uh, to our book, we're asking more questions than we're answering. Um, but um, hopefully we are asking the right questions for future research. This is the intention why we wrote this book um, so that people can refer to it and keep building that common knowledge that we're all um, after. And I thank very much the contributors to the book. Uh, I have the whole um, list here um, on uh, this slide. Uh, and we also thank very much the editorial assistants who helped us get this uh, through the, I don't know how many versions of uh, chapters we have been um, reading. Um, and of course, the team at Routledge uh, and uh, Lord Norton for his great support in getting this published in such a fast uh, manner, two years, uh, less than two years after we first got together. Um, that is faster than the other books that have been published. And I hope that it is um, helpful for future research. Thank you. Thanks, Sven. Uh, and now, before we open the question and answer session, uh, we're going to have a few words from Irina Kamelko. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> uh, well, let me first congratulate Hilmer and Swain and the outstanding team of contributors, contributors to the volume for such a, an amazing publication. Uh, we all know that comparative legislative studies uh, research field is a highly competitive field and publication with the major commercial press is certainly a big win and certainly a significant accomplishment. Uh, this uh, publication continues a tradition of a groundbreaking publications 
and this field started by Norton, Olson, Mezzi, Longley, and the list, of course, can continue. Um, this is a complex world. We all know that we are living in quite complex world, and of course, we need complex solutions. And these solutions do require collaborations. Uh, we, are, we are stronger together, and we are indeed collaborate. When we are collaborating, we can have findings and publications uh, as the one that we're talking about today. Um, uh, the Research Committee of Legislative Specialists, next to my name, you see RCLS, that stands for Research Committee of Legislative Specialists, uh, also known as a Research Committee Number 8 of the International Political Science Association, uh, is a community of uh, international scholars and practitioners who advance knowledge and application of uh, uh, ideas uh, in the field of legislative studies. I see many faces here of our members. Good to see you all. If you're not a member, please contact me and join us. We, we would be thrilled to have you with us. Uh, this community works on the research of discovery, research of application, and of course, uh, implementation of ideas as well through the work of our practitioners. This volume does just that. This volume makes a contribution to advancing the field of the research in the comparative legislative studies, but it also provides an insight into making a difference in the practical uh, world and in practical lives of legislatures uh, around the world. Uh, I'm very sure that this publication will generate discussions and by asking really good questions, generate more research and advance our field of comparative legislative studies even further. I certainly look forward to the works of our editors, Hilmer and Swen in the future, and all our uh, uh, amazing team of contributors to this volume. And in the meantime, uh, it's uh, truly congratulations again on publication of this volume. Uh, the job is definitely well done, guys. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.